Traditional RESTful APIs often return too much or too little data, which requires us to do multiple requests for a single view to get all the data that we need. GraphQL solves this issue by giving clients exactly what they requested for, but designing GraphQL APIs is different from designing RESTful APIs. That's why in this video we'll cover the core concepts of GraphQL and why it exists, the schema design and type system of GraphQL, queries and mutations, error handling, and also best practices for designing GraphQL APIs. Let's start by understanding why GraphQL exists in the first place. It was created by Facebook to solve a very specific pain, which is clients needing to make multiple API calls and still not getting the exact data that they needed. For example, if we imagine we have the Facebook APIs like user API, posts API, comments and likes for the Facebook page, most of the times client can make requests to all of these APIs separately and still not get all the data that it needs, which will require it to do multiple requests to the same API. This of course adds up to the overall latency of the page because the page is still not loaded until all of these requests are made and the data is fetched. But in case of GraphQL APIs, you have a single GraphQL endpoint. So the client specifies the shape of the response and this one endpoint handles all of the data interactions. It is still an HTTP request, but as you can see, we can specify the exact data that we need. For example, we need the user with ID 123 and we need only the name of the user, also posts. And from the posts, we can specify only title. So we don't need the images for this view. And again, with the comments, you can specify the exact data that you need within the object so that you are not doing overfetching of the data. Now let's see the schema design and type system of GraphQL and how it's different from RESTful APIs. The schema in this case is a contract between the client and server. In schema, first of all, you have types, which can be, for example, user type that you specify and you specify all the fields that exist on this user type, which are ID, name, posts, and so on. And as you can see, if the type is not a primitive type like posts, then you can specify another type of post array. And then this post type can be defined separately. Next, we have queries to read data. So this is the equivalent of doing get requests in RESTful API. You specify the query and the function of this query. This can be the user query, which fetches the user with specific ID and also the return type of this query, which in this case is the user type that we defined above. And GraphQLs also come with mutations. You can think of this as the equivalent to post, put, patch, and delete methods in RESTful APIs. So anytime you are mutating a data in the database, you are making a mutation query. Here, as you can see, we have an example of create user method, which accepts name and of course many things in real world. And then it returns the user type that we have defined above. So if you have good schema design in GraphQL, it should mirror your domain model and it should be intuitive and flexible. Next, once you define the schema design and type system, you can start querying and mutating data with this GraphQL API. For that, we have queries for fetching data. Again, this is like the GET requests in RESTful APIs. And here you can specify exactly what you need from the user. This is the same user method that we defined there in the schema. So here you can also specify the exact attributes like the name, posts, and from posts you need the title only. And this will make a request to your GraphQL API and return the exact data that you requested. Similarly, you can also use the mutations that you defined. For example, if you have a create post method defined as a mutation, you can use this to mutate the post. For example, setting the title and body of the post, and then you also specify what data you need to retrieve after this post is created, which is ID and title. When it comes to error handling in GraphQL APIs, this is a bit different than in RESTful APIs, since GraphQL always returns 200 OK status for all responses, even if there was an error. In this case, we have to return errors field in the response, which will indicate that there was an error. So partial data can still be returned with errors, like in this case, we have the user, which is null. And then we have the errors field, which indicates that you have the status code 404, message not found, and path, which is the user in your schema. As you can see, in this case, you can specify the status code in the errors array. 
Since we are returning 200 status codes for all GraphQL requests, that's why we have the status codes specifically mentioned in the errors so that we know what kind of error this is, which is user not found. There are also best practices that we normally follow when designing GraphQL APIs. First of all, the schemas that we saw, it's a good practice to keep them small and modular. Also, we should avoid deeply nested queries. For example, you can have a user and then nested post, and then within the post you can have a comment, so this can be infinitely nested. And to avoid that, we usually implement query limit depths, which is how deep you can go, like how many layers nested you can have in your data. So you specify something like six or seven layers deep. We also use meaningful naming for types and fields so that it also makes from the client side because they both are going to use the same schema. And when mutating data, we always use the input types for mutations. And looking at this, you might think that GraphQLs are always the better solution over RESTful APIs, which is not the case at all. So I'd recommend you watch this video next, where I talk about the pros and cons of each, and when to go with REST APIs, and when to go with GraphQL APIs.